This show is going to be a ton of fun for our Bitcoin and cryptocurrency enthusiasts. But if you're new to that world, don't worry. We have a special guest today who is an expert at making the often complex world of blockchain tech both interesting and easy to understand for the uninitiated. We're excited to be talking today with Kurt Wuckert Jr., an entrepreneur and the chief Bitcoin historian for CoinGeek, one of the leading online Bitcoin publications. His journey with Bitcoin began in the ancient days of 2012, and since then, he's acquired a wealth of experience and knowledge on all things blockchain. His work these days consists mainly of teaching Bitcoin history, function, and future utility for blockchain users and businesses. Kurt, thanks so much for joining us today. Happy to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I've got a ton of questions for you uh, around Bitcoin primarily, of course, because that is, of yeah. course, your specialty. Um, to set the stage a little bit, I mean, Bitcoin is, is interest, in an interesting time right now. Uh, obviously, cryptocurrency and, and blockchain technology more broadly are just everywhere. Um, BTC is, again, over 50,000. CBDCs are, are becoming a household term. Obviously, yeah. there's a very important court case going on right now in London that is going to determine some important issues, and we'll dig into that. And recently, I don't know if you saw, Elizabeth Warren just flew a flag over the Capitol honoring Satoshi. Uh, I did not see that. No, <laughs> I thought it was a joke for sure. And I actually still haven't confirmed that it wasn't, but it seems like it was a real thing. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a troll, right? It's a very obvious troll. Like someone just got someone in her office to, to do this. Oh, so she was just implicated after having been one of the f most fierce critics of, <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to say, yeah, if, if that's how she's announcing her uh, change in position, that's uh, interesting. <laughs> it's a pretty bold one. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. So a lot of senators will fly a flag if you ask them to, right? Especially for in memorial mm -hmm. of someone who's passed or something like that. Sure. So sure. You, she, somebody got very creative and put in a request. For I Satoshi love it. Nakamoto. Well, yeah. we owe that person a beer. So. <laughs> um, Kurt, before we get into all that stuff, uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. Uh, who are you and, and how do you spend your time? What are you passionate about? Oh, man. Um, well, a lot of people know me for my Bitcoin stuff because I've been doing public Bitcoin stuff now since uh, I, I really public since 2017. But if anybody's been a Facebook friend with me, it's been since like 2013. Um, got into Bitcoin. Uh, always thought Bitcoin infrastructure was really cool. So I got into mining pretty early. Uh, lost my shirt basically doing that uh, 2013 and 14 because I decided, oh, yeah, Bitcoin price is never going to go down. I'm going to buy some of these newfangled ASICs out of China. And that was the worst, maybe the worst financial decision I've ever made, actually. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, but uh, since then, uh, stayed in the mining business, did pretty well with uh, GPU mining, ETH and altcoins and stuff for a while, too. Um, but always just loved Bitcoin. Bitcoin is where my heart was at. Um, but, you know, did my foray into stuff. Um, still run a mining pool. Uh, we do host uh, Bitcoin mining infrastructure and stuff for uh, anybody that wants to do uh, any ASIC mining. So including like Litecoin, BTC, you know, whatever else. But I run a BSV uh, mining pool called Gorilla Pool. Um, do a bunch of that, but that's all my, that's kind of like my Bitcoin stuff. I'm also, I'm a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt, been doing that for 15 years. Uh, happily married. My wife is a retired MMA fighter. We've got, uh, two, two and a half kids. My wife is, uh, 30 something weeks pregnant now. So we've got a, a third coming in the early summer. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I've, I've been a big libertarian activist since I was like 16 or 17, which is kind of what got me into Bitcoin stuff, but for all my non-public relationships, they think of me as the uh, the very political guy, or their their jujitsu coach, or uh, you know a, a guy that spends a lot of time at church, which is the other thing I do quite a bit. But uh, so there's 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 a lot of faces of Kurt depending on uh, where you meet me. But primarily when I'm on interviews, people want to talk uh, Bitcoin stuff. The one thing you, you did leave out, though, is that uh, you're a very proud, bald man, just like our friend David here. <laughs> oh, the bald jokes. The bald. Ah, yeah, yeah. We, we couldn't go a whole episode of the bald the tribe. joke. That's all right. It is, it is important to quit on hair early when it starts quitting on hair. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just fight right back yeah. with, the, with the razor. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, well, let's jump into this stuff. I, so our show uh, isn't exclusive or, or even really very focused on... Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. We do kind of dance around those mm -hmm. topics and our co-host Kyle, who um, just so happens to be under the weather today uh, and is regretting not being here because he's, he's a big uh, crypto guy. 
um, primarily sure. in the NFT space. He, he's a he's a pudgy penguin, and he wears that like a badge of honor. Uh, cool. It's how he how he introduces himself to people on the street, you know, so uh, which is cool. Yeah. Um, but for those of our audience who maybe aren't like super well versed in the Bitcoin space uh, or the cryptocurrency space generally, like what mm-hmm. is the importance of this technology? Why does it matter? Um, it depends who you ask. Uh, I definitely come down hard on one of the the far political sides of the cryptocurrency conversation. Uh, so for me, I'm very much a uh, an advocate for use as a uh, sort of a third party attester of property ownership, I think is really, really key. Um, and blockchain gives us that ability to do that because um, <laughs> We have all these problems with jurisdiction. Uh, so if you were to go back in time, like 2000 years and go to a place like Europe, there were like 2000 little city states because jurisdictional power can only go so far because of the problem of communication. And, you know, who's in charge of this? If I go 50 miles away, am I on somebody else's property? I don't even necessarily know. And it's really a problem of record keeping and communications that defines whether or not, uh, you know, any of that's tenable. Now. As we've seen over time, countries get bigger, people become a little more autonomous. Uh, Even though countries uh, for a time became more powerful, you had larger kingdoms. Those have actually decentralized quite a bit because of uh, even simple technology like the printing press decentralized a lot of Europe very quickly. Um, And then moving forward, the internet uh, kind of brought more freedom and, you know, then there's always backlash. And so I see blockchain as uh, sort of the next step toward greater freedom that uh, that Satoshi Nakamoto gave us um, really practical tools to use about 15 years ago. Um, and the way that it does that is is twofold. It is by reducing the friction in in payments. So I can do business with somebody in North Carolina or let's say South Carolina as easily as I can do with somebody in South Korea. It's never going to be easy to do business in North Korea <laughs> for now, but um <laughs> But but it shouldn't be a problem for me. Someone, I live in South Florida. It shouldn't be a problem for me to do business with anybody anywhere if they have an internet connection and if we're willing to do business in Bitcoin, right? Uh, so that's the first big thing is a huge reduction in payment friction. And then the second one is a massive increase in data integrity because uh, you, know, you can use a notary or you can trust the government office to like hold the deed to your home. But as we know, uh, both malice and incompetence make it that every once in a while, somebody knocks on your door and says, Hey, I actually own your home because somebody filed it wrong. I noticed I paid your taxes for three years. Get out of my house, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and that's a huge problem. And, uh, Bitcoin blockchain, the technology allows us to have uh, an attestation of data that is completely separate. And even if you suck at your job, you can't lose information on the blockchain because it is widely distributed and it's not really controlled by any entity. Nobody can go in and delete a file. And so once it's there, it's there. And that has a lot of very practical uses for enforcement of all kinds of property rights, not just big expensive ones, but also you know, very small tokens of ownership, you know, everything from, hey, I own this whole county worth of farmland or, hey, I own this pudgy penguin JPEG, which has its own value. And and it allows um, data integrity and, and the integrity of ownership uh, to be distributed really widely. So those are the two really key things that blockchain technology gives us. Interesting. And and you mentioned early on in that uh, in that description that uh, payments friction goes way down. And I'm curious if you can illuminate for us that piece of it, and then maybe go into a little bit of the original value proposition of Bitcoin, uh, the white paper version, and, and then how it's changed over time. Sure. Um, so th- this is why I said I, I have a very political uh, view on Bitcoin, is that the popular view about Bitcoin is that its primary function is as a store of value. So that you want to uh, essentially have like, you know, 20 years ago, everybody would have said, oh, rich people have a Swiss bank account. And in that account is, you know, maybe it's Swiss francs, maybe it's some dollars, maybe it's some gold. You got a few Rolexes in there. And, you know, you, you, that's kind of your doomsday get out of Dodge bank account is is your Swiss account. Now, that has changed very much to Bitcoin BTC because it's a hell of a lot easier uh, to manage private keys, either in your head or, or in a in a box somewhere else. And you can store a billion dollars in value in Bitcoin and you can cross borders with it and whatever. Like there's no limitation to, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to get gold and Rolexes over the border without paying taxes and duties and having people ask, you know, why the hell you have, 
even 10 grand worth of property with you as you cross a border. And yeah. so um, that is a practical use case of Bitcoin. But politically, the popular view is that's kind of the only real use of Bitcoin uh, is is that sort of asymmetric store of value for people that that have that sort of need. Now, the original Bitcoin, when you look at, uh, you know, what Satoshi Nakamoto wrote in the white paper and a lot of his early writings, uh, he was talking about, you know, very simple reduction in payments. And the reason why this is possible is because if if you have lots of computers that are distributed across the network and it takes one or two seconds for a broadcast payment to be accepted by the network as valid. So if you attempt to broadcast a payment that is, you know, breaks a rule or is a coin that you don't actually control, every node that sees that will immediately say that's an attempt to do something malicious and they'll ignore it. And so Bitcoin allows, uh, let's just say I'm in South Carolina again and I want to do business with somebody in South Korea and they say, cool, can you send me uh, an escrow payment for $10,000 because you want to buy something that's here in South Korea, we'll ship it to you. And then upon delivery, that money gets released, right? So what you can do is what's called a partially signed Bitcoin transaction. So it's half a signature. And the second half of the signature uh, needs to be signed off by you know FedEx, for example. So when I sign for the thing that I've received, that becomes broadcast to Bitcoin. Now everybody's paid, everybody got their stuff. And we've essentially eliminated all the problems of trust in that whole transaction. Now, PayPal and credit cards offer you similar uh, sort of things, but you're paying sometimes 10% fees in order to use those services. Whereas in Bitcoin, they should be sub cent payments regardless of the size of the transaction because of network efficiency. And if the network is wide open and functional, then you know you can use it for international escrow and international settlement or international sending pennies across a ledger. And the reason for that, the reason why it works so well is because Bitcoin is fundamentally a competitive network. So every node should be competing to be the best node. And if you're trying to be the best node, like what, what does that mean in a financial sense? If you're trying to be the best bank, you're trying to offer, oh, well, we'll, we'll give you your your paycheck within two hours of it being received and we'll uh, we'll settle your payments faster. We'll give you better interest rates. We won't charge you so much in fees, right? So same thing with Bitcoin nodes, like better, faster, cheaper, more service, more reliability and whatever else. So if it's fundamentally competitive, then then nodes are competing kind of like banks or kind of like a bank mixed with an ISP in offering um, the best kind of data money services that they can. Now, the reason this is political is because in BTC, um, Bitcoin, the, what people colloquially think of as Bitcoin, is that those things have been, um, they've basically created a bunch of arbitrary swim lanes that everybody needs to compete in. So that competition is still there, but they say, well, you, you're, yes, you're allowed to compete, but only so far as you only add six megabytes per hour to the entire network. And so... A transaction, a Bitcoin transaction has a, a size of about 250 bytes plus whatever arbitrary data you attach to it. And so you can fit a couple hundred thousand transactions in a block and then a couple hundred thousand transactions times uh, a block every 10 minutes means you have this limit of about six megabytes per hour. And as soon as you start to approach that, it's kind of like imagine if there was only a one lane highway between New York and Washington, D.C. And if you really needed to go, you'd pay the extreme toll in order to take that drive, but otherwise be like, I'm just not using that system. And so they they created this, uh, I, I call it like arbitrary subsidy for themselves by saying, okay, we're gonna create arbitrary, <clears throat> excuse me, arbitrary scarcity by just creating all these arbitrary limits. And then that arbitrary scarcity will raise people's fees and wouldn't better fees be good for infrastructure providers and you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but I would also argue that's an authoritarian uh, pre-planned economy, which leads to all kinds of spillover, uh, you know, second and third order negative effects of Bitcoin, which we perceive as sometimes it costs 10 cents to send a Bitcoin and sometimes it costs 50 bucks. And so I can't do $50 commerce on days when it's $50 fees because there's, there is no, there's nothing there. So that's, right. that's the real problem. Uh, but Bitcoin fundamentally was supposed to be lightning fast and essentially free, perceptibly free. There is a fee, but but to the user, each individual user, it should be perceptibly free to use. So many directions I want to go from that. Uh, <laughs> can you can you explain 
why uh why that was instituted the block size limit um depends who you ask uh i th- i think it is largely malicious actually um so if you look at you know when when bitcoin really started to quote unquote professionalized. We're looking at the era between 2013 and 15. It's the first real pump uh, when Bitcoin got over $100 and then very rapidly went to about $1,200 in early 2014. All of a sudden it got a million eyes on it. Like, oh my God, this incredible investment opportunity. Well, <clears throat> that's great. But then it got more people saying, okay, what is this Bitcoin thing actually? And to anybody that reads the Bitcoin white paper or reads anything Satoshi Nakamoto ever said, all of a sudden you're looking at a way to undercut the business model of MasterCard and Visa and PayPal and all these other massive companies that basically the the what we call the PayPal mafia today or, you know, the Silicon Valley fintech elite and the elite banking and payments app people from old school New York, London, Switzerland, etc. So if I'm MasterCard and I'm looking at in 2014, Bitcoin is the largest performing asset in the last 50 years. And so all these Bitcoin people all of a sudden just got very rich and they have a payments technology that is better than the payments technology that we have commercialized and built our lives on. Makes sense to me to say, okay, who can we buy out in order to either control this and use it for our benefit? And if we cannot control it, how do we shelve it? Yeah. Um, If you look at 2014 and 15, you look at the creation, uh, MasterCard Ventures uh, put together a um, basically a uh discovery group like we're going to look into this thing and within six months they created a uh, investment firm called digital currency group which was a conglomeration of companies like uh who do you got B- big insurance companies uh big payments companies big banks and whatever to create this incubator of of bitcoin technology uh run by a, an old banker named barry silbert then digital currency group started investing money into every startup there was in the blockchain space. So, which people were scrappy. They were still basically poor. You get a guy named Barry knocking on your door and saying, Hey, I'd love to write you a $5 million check. We'll professionalize your company. We'll take a little bit of equity, but we'll also give you access to the other companies in our portfolio. If you're a young business person, you're looking at that and saying, Hey man, that's a pretty good deal. Mm -hmm. And most people did. So if you look at, All the big businesses today, you got Coinbase and Kraken and Abro Wallet and uh, your development firms like Blockstream and Lightning Labs and all these other. So from top to bottom, retail applications all the way to low level infrastructure companies, they're all part of Digital Currency Group's portfolio. And Digital Currency Group is just a fancy face painted on, you know, MasterCard Ventures and AXA Global and, you know, old world, old money. And so all of a sudden, within, you know, a year and a half of that era, this notion of Bitcoin is this incredible new payments technology pivoted to Bitcoin is this amazing store of value. And wouldn't you know it, there's all these other altcoins that you can trade on these exchanges that we also control. And as we've seen, you know, look at the Coinbase uh, stock is exploding today. Coinbase has made a few billion dollars off of getting people to trade you know, Shiba Inu coin for Litecoin, for Bitcoin, for Ethereum, for, you know, any number of another hundred or 500 tokens. And it's turned it into, hey, here's a really great way to gamble effectively. And if you gamble well, you make a lot of money. And isn't that the coolest thing in the whole world? And when you make that money, store it over here in Bitcoin because it's a it's a killer store of value. And Bitcoin, Bitcoin's always going to go up forever. So trade over here and give us your trading fees and then hold it over here and 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 whatever else. And so that's a very compelling argument for people. Um, you know, people have not... Uh, People have not typically done well with investment schemes. If you would go back 20 years, it would be, uh, hey, here's here's how to make a bunch of money in real estate. And you don't even need any capital to, to try. And, you know, it's yeah. like people love this concept of I'm going to get out of the rat race. And so the whole crypto narrative has become very much get out of the rat race by doing crypto stuff, trading. Um, and then, you know, with that, then it then it just becomes its own culture. Now. Most people in the blockchain space have no idea that any of this was payment technology and they just look at it and I mean, shoot, I get my neighbors and stuff. No, I'm like a Bitcoin guy. And they're just like, hey, bro, what do you think of some token I've never heard of? And like, I don't know, man, I, I, I put like 500 bucks into some. I hope it goes some, you know, and it's like, can't get past it. That's all anybody can think about. Yeah. 
because it's become an opportunity cost to even try to build a payments company on Bitcoin because you could just spend that money on Bitcoin and you'll have made more money. So yeah. that's kind of the, that's, that's really how it changed is, is you, not you, but people rewarded that sort of gambler mindset behavior. And so you get the dopamine hit of, holy crap, I made some money. But you also get the fact when you really start to make a lot of money, then it's like, hey, don't go rock on that boat, man. I, I, I was a construction worker three years ago and I, I made $800,000 by accident. And now I get to kind of do what I want with my life. And like, you know, and awesome, like power to those people. I'm very happy for people who made money, but it has come at the detriment of Bitcoin disrupting essentially anything. Mm. I, I've yet to hear any real feedback from anybody like what has Bitcoin changed other than the portfolios of of people that got in early? Yeah, but hasn't the and just just kind of trying to steal man the other side wasn't the argument something like and and I was a very peripheral actor in here so for, it, it, I might be <laughs> not doing a good job but correct me if we don't if we increase the block size and we make it so that transaction costs go down we won't re reward the miners so miners will go away and they'll do other things and then. If we if we if we can't run a blockchain, and remember for people who don't know cryptocurrency, the blockchain is like the record of all the transactions on a very old school computer, a very like simple computer. Then it's mm -hmm. not going to be as secure as if we and if 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 we increase the blockchain size and we have more data moving around in a in, in a single mm -hmm. block. Is that was that a bad yeah, argument? I mean, was it never true? It, well. It, <laughs> It kind of depends. So if if you look at their argument, like their argument is technically true that, yes, if if you're mining on BTC, for example, and on days when the fees are really high, yeah, you're making a lot more money mining and that's a good thing. But the problem is, is if your business model can't scale, then it's you're still only limited to the amount of people that can get in at all. So it's kind of like running like a really nice steakhouse. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can go to like Peter Luger's in New York City and they've been around for a hundred years, they're making enough money, right? But they will never make as much money as McDonald's because McDonald's is making 10 cents on every cheeseburger they sell, but they sell a billion burgers a year. Mm -hmm. And you know, that, so it really depends what you're trying to solve for, right? So in a basic sense, I wouldn't mind being an equity investor in McDonald's or Peter Luger's because I'm making money either way. But the question is, is what is Bitcoin for? And, mm -hmm. and the answer is, is Bitcoin is a payments technology that also, you know, we get the spillover benefits of reducing economic friction globally, which to me sounds like an opportunity to insert like another 4 billion entrepreneurs into the global economy. And I want to live in a world where there's 4 billion more people competing to get my business by providing cool services. Mm -hmm. So what we see with Bitcoin is, yeah, a lot of people got rich. A lot of people can still run a node at home if they have a desire to, because yes, that data set is still small. Um, but what we don't see is the is the negative impact of not giving uh, essentially world class fintech tools to people who who don't have another way to get it. And so it's 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 hard because it's not like Bitcoin has been a failure from a monetary standpoint. Like it's it's hard to argue that it failed when there's like. Hey, look at look at all these people that got richer, got freer, got whatever. But but ultimately, it's you're, you're missing the uh, the opportunity cost, which we can't calculate from yeah. from where we're at. But um, and then to your question about like the data size, um, it's funny because Satoshi Nakamoto addressed this actually really early because it was the very first criticism upon issuing the Bitcoin white paper was from a guy saying. Well, isn't that data going to get too big? And don't we want everybody to run a node at home? And he specifically said, yeah, for a little bit of time, we want as many people as possible. But over time, it needs to transition to being something that operates in large server farms. Like we want this to become like a commercial tool mm -hmm. for, for commerce. And then that's when everybody started saying like, ah, this is a dumb idea initially. Mm -hmm. um, but Satoshi was very clear that no, the database size shouldn't matter because you should be making money by running a node. And if you're making money by running a node, then just buy more hard drives, buy more network access, you know, that kind of thing. Like <clears throat> scale your business. If right. if you could have a billion customers, why would you say, well, we can only have a million customers? Kurt, I'm curious around that conversation. I think the main objection that people have, right, is, oh, if I can't run a node at home, 
then uh, then the network is going to become less decentralized, right? And more centralized mm -hmm. into these server farms and stuff. What is decentralization within the Bitcoin space? What, is, what does that yeah. word mean? Is it, does it mean what people <laughs> think it means in terms of like being able to validate transactions themselves? Yeah, I, I don't even think people know what they think it means. <laughs> like, it's one of those it's one of those terms that is like you can't define it. Like right. the very scientific definition is there's not a single point of failure. And so the answer would be, I mean, you need two peers for the peer to peer network. So if you have three, you are very technically a decentralized peer to peer network. Right now, you're on a scale that is the smallest version of a decentralized peer to peer network. But the question is, is at what point do you get a diminishing return? Is it at 20 peers or is it at 20 million peers? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, um, there are ways to calculate that where you start to get like network latency issues or, you know, if there's 20 million peers, like it can't actually find a valuable direct path. And so now you get data bouncing through a bunch of nodes that are going to slow it down, mm. um, which we've actually seen with things like uh, LimeWire and stuff like that, where you used to be like, Oh, I should be able to download this song in six minutes and it took 40 for some reason. And it's because you're seeding it from, you know, laptops that are, you know, coming on and offline or this guy's on a dial up connection and all that. Like it just is like, well, why do I want to do that? When in reality, uh, you actually just want to get data from like the 10 best peers, which might be the peers that are closest to you or they might be the ones that are that just have the best connection because they're in a you know world class data center. And so. There's a lot of sort of pre-planning in the launch of something where you can uh, make a determination about that. And I look at that and say, look, if we had 10 big mining companies and they were geographically distributed. So if, you know, power goes out and half the United States, like Bitcoin doesn't go down. Like, yes, it's a good thing. We should have nodes on every continent. But how many nodes on every continent? I think the answer is, is if it was three to five and they were in very robust data centers, then that is sufficiently decentralized without causing, um, you know, whatever problems come from the diminishing return or, or perhaps uh, beginning to create a negative return uh, by having more nodes. Now, that's very much an opinion uh, and it's a, an unpopular one. And there are people that could talk to you for two hours about why I'm wrong and stupid. But ultimately, um, for me, it's about the functionality of the tool, um, <clears throat> you know, and so sufficient decentralization is. How do you make it secure? How do you know that you can rely on it forever without overdoing it? And and right now, that's a, that's a very philosophical question. It's kind of like saying, how much government is the right amount of government, right? It's well, like, zero, well, but that's that's an easy one for a libertarian yeah. stance. But, it, but it's a political <laughs> question, you know. Yeah. It's and, and everybody's going to have their own answer to that based on what they value and and everything else. Yeah, and so I think just to kind of maybe add to that. It sounds like, I mean, the, the absolute centralization would be having your money stored in a singular bank that has singular control yes. over the number that generates in your online banking portal when you pull it up and they can change yes. it, right? Does, it, are people concerned that there's a risk that um, there will be undue influence on the network the more and more centralized those nodes get? Is that the objection to the idea uh, that you put forward? So there's a few key things. Like if all your nodes are in the United States, then the entire network is privy to U.S. law. And then U.S. law has all these predatory or predatory financial regulations and, and whatever. Now, as soon as you have a serious node uh, or node, you know, saturation in places like Africa and South America and Europe, now all of a sudden you say, well, it's a global network. The U.S. doesn't necessarily have jurisdiction over it. And that, I agree, is a good thing. Like that is that is part of the purpose of it. The other one is this notion that uh, outside of the influence of nodes, what if the nodes themselves become malicious, right? So if there are only three nodes and, you know, they, they all get social engineered into, you know what, let's rob that guy and let's give all this money to, to me. If all nodes agree to do that, like that becomes the state of the ledger, right? So, so that is also a risk. Like malicious nodes are definitely a risk, but um you know, there's also I mean, there's lots of other things. There's even, like I said, like geography, maybe power goes out. Right. And so if you didn't have enough nodes uh, that were outside of the power outage, all of a sudden Bitcoin's just down like that. That is its own very practical uh, problem. You know why you want sufficient decentralization. So so people will tell you, I don't care about centralization. And that is a fallacy. I do care about decentralization. But decentralization is a is a feature 
uh, of of security. And once once the security pillar is is dealt with, any further decentralization is a little bit masturbatory as far as I'm concerned. It's mm. like we've got twenty thousand nodes, and it's like, but are they better than having fifty nodes? Like, c- can you quantify that? And I would argue the answer is no. If you are a small business owner looking for exponential growth, you have to connect with Adam Thune at Intellectual Patriots. He will revolutionize your business game and help you get to the next level. Adam can streamline your business practices and advertising strategies to improve your bottom line. His expertise in data engineering means he can build you the systems you need to collect and analyze market data. His mission is to provide you with invaluable insights to fuel your success. From grant writing and business proposals to digital systems integrations, even AI management, Intellectual Patriots is a one-stop shop for cutting-edge solutions. Don't wait another second. Visit intelpatriots.com to learn more. That's I-N-T-E-L patriots.com. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Zesty Beverages. They're on a mission to unf*** the standard American diet by crafting drinks with fewer calories and more nutrients from real food. Their lineup of delicious offerings now includes Electric Peak Yerba Mate, postbiotic sodas, keto-friendly, ready-to-drink margaritas, and hard teas. Wondering what a postbiotic soda is? Well, head on over to ZestyBev.com to learn more and find a retailer near you. Once again, check them out online at ZestyBev.com. That's Z-E-S-T-Y-B-E-V.com. So uh, at least one thing from my point of view, because I tend to focus more on the public policy end of things, it seems Mm -hmm. to me that where Bitcoin really went from the pre-2014 vision, where it was really clear to me that was a payment process oriented technology to something else. And I think your description of it is perfect. Like I I described exactly what I experienced and saw. But it was also when we decided that it was a property or a commodity to be taxed. And once Mm -hmm. that happened, it created a tremendous disincentive to actually do commerce in it. It was one thing to do (laughs) commerce in it overseas for one digital asset for another, but it didn't make any sense anymore for me to go on overstock.com and buy something because you used to be able to do that, right? You could buy a couch or something like Mm -hmm. that, have it delivered to you. And... But but I ha- I would have this taxable liability for the difference in that and be able to track that taxable liability and potentially be held accountable to it someday. Even back in like 2016, it was still like it, this is yep. this is going to be a problem at some point, and so I'm mm-hmm. I'm going to be more hesitant than I otherwise would be, and therefore it never got really past that initial stage of a- an experimental technology for payments, but mostly yep. just for gambling at that point. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, no, it's it, absolutely true. Uh, in fact, one of one of the key things when I started podcasting a lot about Bitcoin in 2017, uh, I would all I said that on every episode that Bitcoin will become what we use it for. Mm. And if we are primarily using it as a store of value and a trading asset, it will be regulated like a piece of property that that has sh- uh, long and short term uh, taxation based on it being an asset to be traded. Mm-hmm. However, if the majority of people are using it as cash, just like any emerging technology. If we were responsible, if we were self-governing enough to use Bitcoin in this very specific way to reduce commerce, it would have been treated like a cash system. And so, you know, we make the argument for the regulators when we treat it as an offshore gambling asset uh, that, that like, okay, I guess we need to tax and regulate this the way that it's being used, regardless of how it was intended to be used. And so, um, that's yeah you're absolutely right like now yes it doesn't make any sense that i need to figure out my cost basis if i'm going to you know buy something with bitcoin and then i gotta file that properly on my taxes and is it a gain is it a loss when did i get those specific satoshis it's it, they've turned it into a nightmare right and now now it makes much more sense to keep your coins with a custodian and then let their accounting api figure out your taxes at the end of the year and you know that's I, frankly, it sucks. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Speaking of yeah. centralization, that's a great way to look yeah, at it. Well, there. right, right. Yeah. We've we've handed it over to well, the SEC and you know BlackRock and whoever manages my ETF is now, you know, by de facto, kind of in charge of the direction that Bitcoin goes. Yeah. Well, to the point that you made about you know the 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 switch in the use case, and I think it's a really good point that you made, David. There was this split, this ideological split between keep the block size small or let it scale indefinitely. Can we talk a little bit about about Bitcoin and kind of define uh, for people the differences between what became what what is BTC and then what became mm-hmm. a BCH and BSV from that? Uh, also, sure. also noting that we we have uh, all three represented in our podcast hosts. Like you're a BSV guy, 
Kyle does BTC and I'm a BCH guy. So it's oh, all, okay. we have nice. all the different yeah, groups. There it is. On the fucking, <laughs> Fairly <kidding>. represented. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so yeah, in a very basic sense, um, you know, B- BSV is about Bitcoin originalism. BSV stands for Bitcoin Satoshi vision um, as a kind of a way to be particularly conservative to say, hey, what what did Satoshi envision for the use of Bitcoin? And can we get back to that? And the answer is maybe. <laughs> but um, with BTC, uh, you know, B- BTC is the classic uh, Bitcoin ticker. Um, it is carried forward because um really largely because uh, like the exchanges have decided they're going to assign tickers how they see fit. Um, but from a technical standpoint, there's a, there's a lot of little things and I don't want to get too in the weeds with the tech, but basically um, the big split was in 2017, there was a discussion where developers and miners and commercial interests kind of came to an agreement. Uh, they came to a pre-agreement in Hong Kong. So it was called the Hong Kong agreement. And then they did a second agreement a little later in 2017 called the New York Agreement, where they got together again to sort of say, okay, look, yes, we need to raise the block size limit in order to uh, lower fees and make sure Bitcoin is a usable cash system for people because that was its original intent. But we also want to add this new uh, compression algorithm and and it does a few other things, but it um, limits transaction malleability which allows uh, layer two solutions on Bitcoin or sort of adjacent to Bitcoin. Um, So they called this segregated witness. So the way that they did it is they took Bitcoin signatures, which is uh, Satoshi defined a Bitcoin as an unbroken chain of digital signatures. Um, And what they said is, well, let's break the chain of digital signatures and make them smaller. (laughs) So digital signatures are the most computationally expensive thing to uh, validate by a Bitcoin node. So what they said is, Okay, what if we took signatures and instead replaced them with hashes, which are much smaller? It's it's easier to validate a hash. And then we create a second Merkle tree, and that Merkle tree will hold the witness data that promises that those signatures exist and were validated by the network, but you don't actually get to see those signatures. And what you get is a space savings and a cost savings. So cool, save some space on the blockchain, save a little bit of cost per transaction. Sounds like a great thing. Problem is, is you're undermining the fundamental definition of a Bitcoin, which was an unbroken chain of digital signatures. Mm -hmm. And so for all the people that say, I really got to run a node at home, man, it's like, yeah, but are you going to parse out or essentially reverse engineer every hash in the second Merkle tree to validate that all those signatures are real? And the answer is no, nobody's doing any of that. So 99% of all people are LARPing. And, you know, they download Bitcoin Core, the the client. They don't check the hashes of the download and they run it because they want to run it. And people are beginners and most people stay beginners in Bitcoin forever. Um, So what happened is they agreed on the block size limit and SegWit. So they call this the SegWit 2X upgrade. Like everybody agreed unanimously. We're going to raise the block size to two megabytes every 10 minutes and we're going to fork in SegWit and we'll all go forward and it'll be kumbaya. And then about... 60 days before it was going to happen, all of a sudden there was this massive developer coup and these small blockers came out uh, with the huge no 2X campaign across Reddit and Twitter and everywhere else. And if you were not on the no upgrade path, you got kicked out of every discussion, you got kicked out of every forum and all this stuff. Then your Bitcoin cashers, or who became the Bitcoin cashers rather, basically said, holy shit, (laughs) <laughs> like we just got stabbed in the back and we have maybe two months to come up with a solution to essentially save Bitcoin. Right. Mm. And so, <laughs> so then it turned into, okay, we got to find somebody that can code up a client that competes with Bitcoin core. It's going to oops, I hit my net, my uh, <laughs> microphone. It's going to split the network and we're going to let both versions of Bitcoin compete in, mm. in the open, in the open economy to see which one is the real Bitcoin. So that's what started this the real Bitcoin conversation about six years ago now. Mm-hmm. Uh, August 1st, 2017, uh, Bitcoin Cash split from Bitcoin Core. Um, there was a lot of weird malfeasances that happened, like a bunch of exchanges like, whoops, we went offline, we're having some kind of a bug and, and whatever else. Um, basically more backstabbing. Uh, and then ultimately it emerged like Bitcoin Cash is has less value than Bitcoin core. And so it's a little more profitable to mine Bitcoin core and whatever else. And, and 
you know, then the, the price pump, all of a sudden we got these massive price pumps on BTC because, you know, it was Tether, which are controlled by the same people and all, all this stuff. It was a, <laughs> honestly, it was a huge psyop basically right. <laughs> to reward the people who stayed with BTC and your Bitcoin cashers uh, stood on principle against a bunch of snakes and, and we kind of all got screwed. I was in that camp. I was a Bitcoin casher at the time. Um, <laughs> so then it was, okay, now what? Now we've got Bitcoin Cash, which isn't perfect either. Like there's a lot of stuff that still needs to kind of be restored if we want to get back to quote unquote the real Bitcoin. So Bitcoin Cash, uh, when it split, had an eight megabyte block size limit. So testing big block game theory and all this stuff on Bitcoin uh, and loosened up another uh, couple of small policies. <clears throat> but then very quickly, the big blockers started to have their own debate. What do we do next? We really should get rid of the block size limit. We really should uh make script unbounded we really should do whatever and then you got one side really wanted to add um uh new op codes in order to basically subsidize specific behavior make it like a thousand times cheaper to create certain types of tokens or or connect oracles to the chain or whatever um and then uh the originalist side was like no can we at least start by just reactivating all of the original Bitcoin opcodes? Because that's going to be a lot of work in and of itself without introducing new variables with unknown consequences. Um, so the, the main split was you had Bitcoin ABC, which issued the original Bitcoin Cash node client. And then you had the people on the Bitcoin SV side. So this would be uh, N-Chain and, and some other companies that were doing R&D on that side. Uh, and then by uh, November 2018, there was another split of Bitcoin Cash, essentially. Uh, and from that emerged Bitcoin SV with, I think at the time, it was 128 megabyte block size limit. Um, Bitcoin Cash has kept now, I think there are 32 megabyte block size limit, but there's a dynamic block size adjustment uh, algorithm in BCH now. So uh, what they say is if it's needed, it will dynamically adjust. BSV has since, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, restored the there is no block size limit um so it's a policy limit instead of protocol um and yeah so now you have unbounded script uh no block size limit no such thing as a uh, standard transaction so there's no uh, limitation to what you can try to do on bsv bch has larger swim lanes than btc but still has protocol level swim lanes that if they need to change there needs to be a hard fork upgrade to the network bsv will not need that um because everything is a uh oh, rut row. It won't. It won't break the network. It might break your infrastructure, but it won't hurt the network. So that's uh, that's where that's at. Gotcha, Kurt. We lost you there for, for a second. So we'll we'll see what oh. what ends up with that. It was just a few seconds, mm -hmm. but I'm curious. Continuing from this conversation, so um, for those that might be a little bit more into into the crypto now and into this like deeper conversation around this stuff, the halvening is is coming up later this year, yep. and that obviously continues to change the <laughs> economic incentives for miners in uh, the way that they interact with the blockchain. You know, their reward for mining each block goes, gets cut in half at, at these yep. four year intervals. And eventually that's going to, that's going to flip to the point where potentially transaction fees could be the predominant reward for a miner. Can you talk about the dynamics there and like what that might mean for the network effects mm -hmm. of the, the various forks? Yep. Uh, so, We'll start with a quote from Satoshi uh, when asked, uh, and he said, there will either be millions of trans transactions or zero. Hmm. That's Bitcoin at scale. Uh, and by zero, he means the network will have failed. Hmm. So, <clears throat> yes, uh, when Bitcoin was uh, issued, the block reward was 50 coins per block. Every 210,000 blocks or roughly four years, that cuts in half. We are currently in the six and a quarter epoch of Bitcoin. Um, but in April of this year, uh, all the Bitcoin forks within about a week of each other will cut to three and an eighth uh, per block. So, yes, the subsidy is diminishing and that subsidy is a ticking time bomb uh, reminding users and infrastructure partners and anybody in the Bitcoin space that at some point you really need to replace that diminishing subsidy. And the thing you replace it with is transaction volume, which you know, is is funny because your small blockers don't want to admit that, but it's a very obvious indication that it is a network designed to be used for transactions. They, however, argue that the economics of it imply that um, 
it is simply getting more scarce over time. And because it is getting more scarce, the dollar value of each asset will go up and therefore the number can go up forever and replace that subsidy, not with Bitcoins, but with dollar value. And that will solve the problem. So that's kind of the fundamental disagreement uh, between small blockers and big blockers on having math and where Bitcoin needs to go. That's ironic because I feel like there's a lot of narrative in the BTC world around thinking in Bitcoin and not thinking in fiat, but really that that would indicate thinking of BTC in, in fiat, would it not? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> That's how I see it. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, this is this is really cool. I want to go into uh, some more stuff regarding BTC, uh, BSV rather and just kind of understand for those that might be... Uh, more inclined to develop things or to, to be interested in altcoins or nfts there's a lot of activity in the ethereum space what mm -hmm. is going on in bsv uh that would incentivize someone to work in bsv versus a layer two or three on ethereum or some other uh, ecosystem so i've always said if ethereum succeeds it fails because it has a very low bandwidth essentially and, and we've seen this if you create a successful project on ETH, all of a sudden fees are $1,000 a transaction to, you know, open a Uniswap account or whatever else. And well, you know, we, we've just hit the limit of the size of this economy, right? And so Ethereum is signaling to us, it's now done it a few times that, hey, we can't have more customers than this using this tool. And, you know, that's, that's fine if you only want to have a few hundred thousand people on earth use this network. But I, you know, it's, it's like pirate radio is also cool, but you're not going to change the world with it. Like you need to have scale. Things need to uh, virally get to everyone or else we're just creating new silos. And, and that's not really good for anybody with BSV. Uh, we've had days where 99.9% .9 of all combined blockchain traffic is on BSV because we have you know, 180 million transactions in a few hours, that kind of thing. Like people set up a, a gambling tournament or the, you know, a big game launch or whatever. And just a bunch of people are using it. And like, wouldn't you know it, the fees still st stay at like a 10,000th of a penny per transaction and the network stays up fine. And, you know, the people that are running really low powered nodes. So like your sort of light wallets and, you know, other people like you might see some issues there, but for the people that understand how to run, you know, the nuances of a, of a BSV node just stays up. And so it's an indicator that, hey, uh, if you would like more than 10,000 customers or even if you'd like more than 10 million customers, uh, <laughs> if, if the business model isn't about the accrual of the base asset, which in Ethereum, it is about accruing, you know, you buy your NFT because you want to sell it for more ETH someday, right? Mm -hmm. So if your business isn't about that, if your business is about scaling to millions of users, but you want to also use the unique properties of a blockchain, you literally have one choice and it's BSV. So um, anything you've ever heard, a pitch about blockchain, if you want to have more than a very small amount of customers, BSV is your option. Secondarily, BSV also has all kinds of very unique properties that don't exist anywhere else. Uh, that includes... Uh, the ability to run an unbounded script. So this would be like, do you want to bootstrap a supercomputer that does all kinds of really novel things using Bitcoin transactions? Like if you have a cool idea that, you know, that that's it, you can't do it on any other network. Like ETH is very easy to program for, but it also has its limits to what you're allowed to do and how many loops you can create and how many, how many processes can you do outside of the cost there's a there's a practical technical limitation in the network as well uh and bsv doesn't really have those they exist but they're emergent like they don't exist in the code if you try to run something and say oh let's do 100 billion calculations like you will crash whatever uh you know is running that but we don't know what that number is it's it could be 100 million it could be a billion whatever like so again it's like let economies compete to I'll tell you right now, if somebody came to me and said, Kurt, I've got a billion transactions a week. Can you handle that? My answer would be probably not today. But if you're really serious, uh, like I would be very happy to, you know, get another account at, at AWS and raise raise all my bandwidth stuff by 10x and, and whatever else. And we will take your business, please. Uh, and then it'd be fine. So it would take less than a week in order to sort of scale up to meet that new need for demand, 
Whereas if you took it to Bitcoin Cash, for example, there would have to be a, hey, we need to coordinate a network wide hard fork and all these other things in order to do that. Same thing with ETH, same thing with Polygon or you know Avalanche or anybody else. They, they would need to do a network wide coordinated upgrade. Whereas on BSV, if somebody came to me, I could literally just make my node more powerful and force the network to just do it. Wow, that's interesting. But if your node yeah. is more powerful, but it needs to be authenticated on other nodes. How, how, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'm kind of confused by that. Like, I, I get what you're saying. Like, if it, if it can stretch and if it can more emergently adjust to a new load or a new requirement or something new in the data, um, mm-hmm. that makes sense. But trying to boil it down to so that non, non-crypto people can understand what we're saying. Yep. Um, how would making your node more powerful make the entire network able so, to handle more transactions? Uh, so right now the soft limit is a four gigabyte block. So we'll mine four gigabyte blocks, which is itself like world record setting, uh, yeah. or it would be on any other network. Um, now the average block size on BSV is not nearly that big. We mine a lot of blocks that are 10 megabytes or hundred megabytes or less than a gig, right? <clears throat> now, if every block I was putting across the network was full of paid transactions at four gigabyte per block, and I was the only one that could do it, all of a sudden, the other nodes in the network are saying, hey, if we just upped our juice, we could be mining these blocks, too. So wow. it's kind of like, you know, oh, shoot, Henry Ford built the car. He's going to monopolize the car industry. And it's like, well, no, now there's 20 serious car competitors and, and whatever else. So it's, right. once you raise the stakes of your economic uh, competition, somebody's going to say, oh, shoot, there's a big piece of pie over there. I better start taking Kurt's pie everybody benefited from the fact that we all had a reason to upgrade our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, And then the world gets the spillover benefits of, Hey, have you noticed this network got 10 times better over the last six months? Mm. Uh, So that's, it's just, it's, it's free market economics at work. Basically. Do you think the game theory uh, necessitates a, a pathway into BSV because it's the only one that can do these certain things that you mentioned? (sighs) I don't think it's guaranteed. Uh, there are a lot of people that be like, it's inevitable. We're going to win. Right. Um, <laughs> I think there's, there's twofold. It's either inevitable that we're going to win or blockchains were not a good idea and they will never get out of the cradle. They will stay a niche industry, which is fine. You know, like not everybody in the world collects fine art or Rolex watches either. And cool. There's a few thousand people who actually really care about a thing. And that's whatever. That's the size of the economy. Um, I think that would really suck. I would call that a massive failure. Um, probably the biggest, uh, uh, you know, biggest lost opportunity in in a hundred years or so. But um, but no, I don't think it's inevitable that we win. Uh, but the flip side is, is if BSV doesn't win, it's because blockchains just they weren't that good of an idea, and then that's what it would be. Hmm. I'm curious because um, <clears throat> well, there there is such a negative connotation around. BSV, right? It's been delisted from every major exchange that I can yep. think of, save a few. Um, it's it's associated with with Craig Wright, who has a, obviously a very negative connotation around him. I'd like to go into yep. a little bit more of that dynamic. Who who is Craig? And and for those that might not be familiar with crypto as much, like what is the controversy around him specifically? So, Craig might be Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, he is the biggest of the big blockers. He's the guy who's says, if we don't get the terabyte blocks before the year 2025, Bitcoin is a failed experiment, uh, which is, you know, five orders of magnitude more than basically 99% of computer scientists would say is even conceivably possible. Uh, so Craig's out there um, as a serious futurist, and he's basically shitting on the current intelligentsia. Now, it remains to be seen whether he's right or not, in 10 years, Craig, Craig will either be the most important inventor of the last 100 years or he'll go down in history as, you know, a, a snake oil salesman. Um, and and we, don't, we don't have the opportunity to say uh, whether that's true or not yet. But he is in court. He is currently being sued by um, COPA, the Crypto Open Patent Alliance, um, basically trying to prove definitively that he is not Satoshi Nakamoto and therefore... Uh, allowing them to encroach on the implied property rights of Satoshi Nakamoto to basically control the development path and stuff of Bitcoin uh, going forward into the next era. Craig is Mm. kind of the only roadblock to 
uh, Copa, which is uh, Jack Dorsey and and uh, some other Silicon Valley types uh, th- that they want to be the you know in control of Bitcoin. And so Craig, um, Craig was outed in 2015 by Wired and Gizmodo magazine as Satoshi, uh, and then within like one day, there was a bunch of articles about. No, here's all the reasons he couldn't be, and he's this gigantic fraud. Um, I've come to believe that Wired and Gizmodo uh, were not ever convinced that he was Satoshi, but in fact, it was about making sure they smear his reputation um, because the takedown articles would have taken weeks or months to produce, uh, mm-hmm. and they came out within 24 hours of those uh, of those articles. So whoever wrote them had access to the same data mm-hmm. uh, and timed it really, really well to immediately... Um, create a bunch of question about whether or not he is. Um, and I should say too, I believe he is. I also believe his story is, you know, as we'd expect from a, you know, dark web issuer of, of a new uh, currency to be, you know, there's, there's some parts of his story that, that don't quite line up. And, and I think the reason is um, uh, as Ian Grigg would say, another famous uh, cypherpunk, he would say people died for Bitcoin. Uh, and if you read what, if you read what Ian Grigg wrote about the Craig Wright story, um, Ian's kind of an insider. Um, basically, that everybody involved in Bitcoin's creation is dead except for Craig. And so I think there's parts of that story, were they alive, that would be like, oh, that's why that really fishy thing looks that way. And either Craig, I, what I really think is Craig simply can't say for either his own safety or, you know, some kind of oath of silence or something. But you know, when he gets into the Satoshi story stuff, big parts of it make a ton of sense. It's like, wow, it's a really compelling story. It really, like you were in the right place at the right time, like here and here and here. And all this stuff seems very clear. But then you get some giant, weird red herring thing that's like, but what the hell is that all about? Why, do, why does this part of your story get so murky? And why can't you very trivially clear that up? And it's, uh, well, you know, like you see him get very nervous about those kind of questions. And it's. What I really think it is, is that Craig's story is probably 80 or 85 percent true. And that other 15 or 20 percent is stuff that's like we will never know because it's it's just too, too buried, too deep, too screwed up. And um, and yeah, so Craig is controversial for for that reason that he can't like definitively prove he's Satoshi, you know, yet or maybe ever. Um, and then also that he is this massive big blocker, which is the very unpopular political position about what Bitcoin is and what it's for and whatever else. And now there's a trillion dollars of market cap over on this BTC as a store of value only sort of narrative. And he's this guy with, you know, if he's Satoshi could potentially unravel the entire thing for them. And so that's why he's controversial. It's why he's, he's hated by a lot of circles. Um, But the fact that he's still here, like he's been a public figure now for going on nine years and, you know, if it's a scam, I mean, it certainly hasn't been profitable for him, but he continues. Uh, he's in court. Right. I literally was you know, reporting on his court case today uh, fighting against, you know, I don't know, 50 billion dollars worth of corporate interests uh, that have decided that it's worth their time to sue him. Uh, and he's just there, you know, steel faced like I'm Satoshi and you guys are going to have to deal with it. And everybody in the room's laughing at him and he's sitting there with his hands crossed saying, I can't change it either, but I'm Satoshi Nakamoto. You know, mm. It's like, all right, man, I, I don't think he's kidding, <laughs> but so, I, yeah. So one thing that's peculiar about this whole debate for me as an outsider is the idea that the product that is supposedly gives unique signatures so you know who's 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 is mm-hmm. the one thing we can't seem to prove. It seems like the first Bitcoin mind was probably by Satoshi, right? Because he's the guy who yeah. tested it out, started the first yeah. node. So why wouldn't he be able to just show, well, here it is. And I, here, look, I can move it from this wallet to this wallet. And now I'm Satoshi, right? Like, th- I don't see yeah. how that is so difficult to prove at that point. Why, why wouldn't it be? So uh, there's a few theories about that. And I, I kind of waffle between them myself. I, did, I don't mm-hmm. really know what... Craig will tell you is, of course I could sign. I could sign at any time. But he goes into a long diatribe about why possession isn't identity. And possession being identity is actually a communist principle. So you can go into Trotsky where he explains, you know, the differences between 
private property and personal property. And your property is whatever you can control. It's about what yeah. you have. And it's the most annoying. I can see you smiling about it. It's like the most annoying well, conversation it's, to have it's, it's with a, communists. Yeah, it's an well, it's an, it's an autistic uh, distinction for for most of yes. us because we're just saying like, <laughs> exactly. well, wait a minute, we're asking a different question. We're not asking what is the nature of property. We're asking, do you own this property? And if Bitcoin's right. advantage, market advantage, is it allows you to claim digital property and you have it, yeah, then show us that you have it. And then and then and then especially in the case of uh, the other question, I want to get to after this though is first why can't he do that and if it's for philosophical reasons then he's just standing on principle then well that's a, also a good cover for someone who isn't who's pretending to be someone they're sure. not sure right yeah, yeah yeah and then second it, it what is the advantage in trying to claim a patent on bitcoin because you can't how do you claim math right it's like a very difficult thing to patent i imagine the code sure. yeah sure we try to patent code I'm, I'm, we, we actually have lots of disagreements about, uh, copyright between Joe and I, cause I'm like a copyright skeptic and, and I'm a musician. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 uh, yeah. Fun, so fun fact, yeah, go I was, I was a copyright s- skeptic as well. Uh, mm-hmm. basically I said intellectual property doesn't exist was mm-hmm. my fundamental position 10 years ago. And it's actually Bitcoin itself that changed my mind mm-hmm. so that you can, that you can physically own a non-physical thing that you can essentially own a series of numbers in in the right order right. and that is property sure that re- that really changed my it's it's the first thread that kind of unraveled and made me more of a an intellectual property guy mm. although i don't advocate i think patent trolling and all that stuff is all kinds of sure. its own problems but um <clears throat> for craig i think the simplest way to to dumb down craig's position is if i sign with satoshi's keys within 2 minutes the response will be well, he stole those. He killed Satoshi. C- Craig's obviously not Satoshi. He just has his property, right? <laughs> sure. And so, again, Craig Craig can give you a 10-hour autistic rant that essentially means that. Okay. And he's right. Right. Like, And so what he will say is, I have to prove I'm Satoshi first or else me using Satoshi's property is immediately undermined by the very powerful people who want to undermine my property. Mm. And... And I think he's probably right about that. Is that the purpose now, of the Copa case for him to prove that? Kind of. It's it's not even about absolute proof. It's literally up to this judge to determine exactly fifty point oh one percent variable. Like I think it's ever so slightly more likely that he is or is not Satoshi, and then therefore UK law will fall down on that side going forward sure if, if we're uh, trusting the uk law and you're saying oh well if i if if craig's argument is we're going to trust uk law and he, he's not saying that right because cope is the one suing him correct right so yeah. um they're trying to exercise a property right that doesn't exist right that that, that they that they, that because they're not claiming their satoshi right they're just saying he can't claim it right am i am i still am i am i on board here Kurt? so there, yeah i mean again this is a really complex like ip and patent law is yeah. itself like a giant quagmire but um basically craig because he's a uk citizen and because uk law is enforceable in like two-thirds of the planet mm-hmm. so it's a good place to to assert those rights if you're going to do it mm-hmm. um he has claimed and won like craig is actually the uk copyright holder of the bitcoin white paper for example mm. And so you cannot put up a Bitcoin white paper anywhere unless it has Craig Wright's name on it as the publisher. Mm -hmm. So Bitcoin.org, for example, if you go, if you're in a UK IP address and you navigate to Bitcoin.org and click the white paper, it says this is not available in your jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And so and it's because they refuse. So if they would put Craig Wright's name on it, they could display that. So that that thing is actually kind of the catalyst of Copa being like, okay, we got to crush this guy because this is this is going to cascade into more and more problems right. because he's also asserting uh, database rights, which is, if you don't know a lot about database rights, it's, a, it's pretty complicated, but ultimately, um, so for example, if you were uh, like the company that, that issues like MySQL, which is a database protocol, you can, they, or they control MySQL. And if you make any change to it, you have to call it MySQL, X. You have to, you know, very clearly mm. change the license and all these other things. Now, you keep the data in your database, but the database rights belong to the company that owns the MySQL database protocol. Now, 
in Bitcoin, <laughs> there's a problem with that because the database technology inherently also includes the data in the database because of the way that it's designed. And so Craig asserting database rights as the creator of the database, what he's also saying is that like when the SegWit change happened, for example, he's saying, I didn't authorize that change and you changed the way data is written to my database protocol, but you're still using the name Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. You need to call that Bitcoin SegWit X or you're violating my ownership of those database rights. Mm -hmm. And so if he's Satoshi Nakamoto, he's right. That that right. is the way that the entire Western Hemisphere looks at database rights, in which case BTC is an example of passing off fraud, hmm. of saying that we're Bitcoin, no asterisk. Cra Craig would assert his rights that anybody running a BTC node in the jurisdiction of the entire Western Hemisphere now owes him some kind of a, like basically a, a passing off fraud settlement and probably also a license fee for uh, use of his database in a way that isn't authorized by the database issuer. Right. And so Copa looks at that and says, however much money it takes, we got to get rid of this guy. Right. But Craig's looking at it and saying, Bitcoin was designed for a very specific thing. I issued it with a database license. Yes, it's MIT open source, but... It also, the white paper had a copyright to Satoshi Nakamoto. And if he can prove he's Satoshi Nakamoto, those copy copyrights and database rights and all the other rights inherent to an inventor of a technology become Craig's. Hmm. And in which case he's saying, look, Coinbase and Kraken and Binance and all those people, they can rename their coin to Bitcoin SegWit Core or whatever they want to call it. But BSV is Bitcoin. That's the colloquialism for the database that I created. And it's the one that follows the database rules of the protocol that I issued. Hmm. Very simple. And well, it's not very simple. There's a trillion dollars of value being held on this other thing. <laughs> yeah. And it's a little hard to figure out who do you sue? So it's kind of it's like everybody. And so that's kind of what <laughs> Copa is, is it's a. It's a conglomeration of basically the same people that are part of Digital Currency Group. It's like 50 companies. Right. So it's every company that you can name in the crypto sphere is a COPA member versus Craig because maybe he's Satoshi. And even if he is Satoshi, they don't want him to be Satoshi because he's litigious and he's, he's autistically specific about his own digital property rights. Mm. And so that's, that's what's at stake here. Mm. Okay, so fifty companies are suing. <laughs> Sorry, that's a lot. No, this is great. No, no, I just, this is great. It's just I'm I have even more questions. I have more things I want to talk about in that weird part of that because okay, so Go for it. if you if you authenticate that you're Satoshi Nagamoto by by producing the keys and moving a Bitcoin around, and then they say you stole it, well, it's now up to the accuser to prove that you stole it. It's not up to you. Yes. That's not how property works, right? Mm. You can't just say like, wow, well, you, you got a car, you're driving around. Someone says, well, I don't like that you have that, so I'm going to accuse you of stealing it they don't just to get to then bring you to court you have to go through a process of proving that you actually have a case yeah so that's the thing that bothers me about the whole thing that feels like it's a distraction or a way to boost bsv or something like that although i yeah. i like the vision i am a i'm the kind of guy who wants something that competes with the traditional financial system i don't want digital yeah. gambling as as cryptocurrency exclusively although like you i'm fine with that but what i'm confused what i'm concerned about is if he is, this kind of thing feels like a way to string people along rather than just proving that he's Satoshi by producing the keys and then say, you know, come at me, bro, because I he's at that <laughs> point a, a trillionaire. Right. And can then yeah. and then can, you know, hire, you know, private security, like do, do what you got to do. Sure. Like, I don't I don't know what that looks like, but no, and I'm and not sure why bet you would... between, you know, between, you know, me, you and God, I agree. I actually think yeah. if Craig can sign even if he's bending his own principles, signing solves a lot of his problems. Now, we are talking about somebody who's got like 180 IQ and is a diagnosed Asperger's sufferer uh. Uh, and all kinds of other, like he's a very, very weird character when you come down to, you know, who is this person. Sure. And so, which you'd expect Satoshi Nakamoto to be, and like, it's not like the rest of us, but right. Craig is also like, currently working on five PhDs and he already has three others and then like 30 master's degrees and wow. he only sleeps two hours a night. And instead of sleeping, he puts on books and listens to two books a night. And like, so we're talking about somebody who 
sort of perceives the world and his own principle and his own goals, it's like, bro, is 10 master's degrees enough? And he's like, yeah. no, I want to have more degrees than anyone who ever lived. And I want to have more patents than Edison. And I want to have, and it's like, <laughs> you're, you're not going to have a like, Hey man, you can take a vacation. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, like he just, he's just, he's very, very, very irritatingly different. I, I know him personally. Mm. Uh, and he and I have good rapport. I think he, you know, trusts me as much as he can trust anybody, but you know, you, you get talking to him and you start to realize even the things that he values and cares about in private, like he's a very weird character. Mm. And so what seems reasonable to the rest of us, y- y- you can't get him there sure. basically. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So if he wins this case with 50.01%, you know, Agreement from the judge that he is more likely than not Satoshi. The implication is that BTC would have to change its name. It would probably have some kind of economic impact. We don't know how large or small on the spot price of, of BTC. Yeah. And would it, would it affect the, would it, would it affect the uh, network effects of BSV at all? Or would people who are inclined to think Craig is still a fraudster, just still think Craig's a fraudster. It wouldn't require that exchanges list BSV, would it? Well, so so he has a number of other cases that are tangential to it. So if he wins this case, there's like five other, like there is a specific uh, fraud passing off case. There is a case against like a, a handful of specific developers of Bitcoin Core, uh, there's a case about um, kind of all of the stuff I've been talking about, like the copyright stuff, the database rights stuff. Like those are all individual right. suits. Mm-hmm. So if he wins this one, it becomes a predicate case that allows him to continue to keep pursuing this other stuff. However, if he loses, those other cases probably kind of go away. Sure. Um, but even so, he also just as Craig has like 3000 patents about the technology anyways. And so he's even said it on the stand. Like, it doesn't matter if I'm Satoshi, I'm still the biggest patent holder in the space. I've invented all these patents since 2011 and I can prove it and they're filed and here's this. And Taproot, for example, the method that it is forked into the protocol of BTC, I own three patents for the methods that you used. He said, I'm still going to sue the developers who who forked it in and all this stuff. So it's like Craig is definitely not going away unless, you know, God forbid, like they really, really make him go away. But sure. um, <laughs> which is, you know, much greater than zero risk at this point. But um, but yeah, the, the implications would be, you know, let's say he wins it. And then it's funny because he said a few times, if we can prove I'm Satoshi, like once it's agreed that that identity is my identity. I can move my coins with impunity, meaning then I'll, maybe I'll just start transacting in the Satoshi coins that have been sitting there for 15 years. So um, I think if those kind of things start happening, A, you know, heads explode, but B, then it becomes kind of a media sensation. Then all of a sudden right. it's like, oh my God, like the, the patience of this son of a bitch, right? <laughs> and then yeah. it's, <laughs> and, and and then you get the, well, what does he believe about anything? And so he's out here saying BSV is the real Bitcoin. And then now all of a sudden there's an extra few million people that are saying, maybe maybe we should take another look at this Bitcoin thing and what this crazy guy is saying and whatever else. So yeah. I think tangentially, yes, it could cascade to that. I don't think it's going to be a, you know, j- gavel, you know, judge hits the gavel and BSV flips BTC. But I, but it but it is a linchpin that that starts a cascade. I think. Well, I think that's the um, I think the current BTC people are mostly operating on we have the brand that is the meme. Oh right? yeah, that is the space. Hundred percent. Right, and if we lose that, then we lose the thing that gives us our leverage in the space. And once we lose that, yeah. we lose our value because it, it's the impression, it's the animal spirit, to put it in a Keynes term, <laughs> of the impression of the value of it that gives it its worth, rather than the utility it actually provides to the end user, right? Which is yeah. in their case, the store of value question. Yeah. Correct. So where does the case stand right now? And if you have a, a, an idea or an impression, who do you feel like is winning at this moment? If you can tell. <laughs> Wait, honestly, it's in the worst possible place, which is to say, I don't think either side has made a compelling argument for themselves. <laughs> so uh, today was day 10 of me watching every moment of court, and um, 
And by compel, like both sides have compelling things, but nobody like unless you're already hard line on on the decision, like any third party, like if you brought a jury in, I'm sure the jury would be like, what the hell do I decide on any of this? <laughs> yeah. And 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 it's up to the judge. And we're a little less than halfway through the trial. The trial is going to go into, I think, the second week of March. Um, and so, <laughs> honestly, it's just been a lot of like, here's all these reasons why we think your documents and stuff that sort of imply your Satoshi aren't real. Whereas Craig's like, yeah, but they look not real because we know everybody who studied it knows Satoshi got hacked in 2014 and all of his data got leaked. And so you can't trust document provenance anyways. Mm. Like, but you can see here's my first Bitcoin patent was in 2011. Was anybody else working on like high level Bitcoin intellectual property in 2011? And they're like, yeah, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're Satoshi Nakamoto. Like, yeah, but let's bring in, you know, now we've heard six or seven witnesses that kind of knew Craig in the Satoshi era. And they're like big company, like Vodafone and Lassiter's Casino and some of these people who are like, yeah, I don't know. Craig told us he was going to create this immutable logging system for us for our IT security. And he explained it was kind of a hash chain thing. But I I don't know. Like, I, I worked in, like, I'm an IT guy. But when you talk to Craig, like, Craig's fucking fractal IT, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so... It's so in you know 2007 they wouldn't know what the hell he was talking about. I'd be like, just trust me, all your stuff is on this hash distributed system that I'm creating. And then it's like, but then the response is, is yeah, but he's a client of yours. You guys did a billion dollars worth of work with each other. Is doesn't he have an incentive to lie in your favor? You know, and so so there's been a lot of things that are like, ooh, that's juicy. And then the but the responses is, is like, yeah, but do you have anything other than testimony or weird you know low resolution documents and and really neither side does no neither side has a i mean it's incumbent upon craig to prove that he is but on copa's side like you know rhetorically it's impossible to prove that he isn't also Mm -hmm. and so unless quote unquote the real satoshi shows up and proves he's the real satoshi they don't really have a knockout fight but craig's craig's arguments are well, let's bring in my little sister. Like we literally heard from his little <laughs> sister today, Danielle. She's in her forties probably, but um, she's like, "Oh yeah, no, he always used Japanese nicknames, and he was always into computers." And, and it's like, sure, that's like a very circumstantial predicate piece of information. And but that doesn't mean he's Satoshi Nakamoto. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so earlier, like, even me, like I do think he's Satoshi, but it's like if I had to vote a hundred percent, you know. <laughs> with with the evidence that's been given, it's like neither side. Like I'm just barely 50-50 myself based on the evidence that we've seen. And it's, hmm. it's unfortunate, but it's what we should expect from somebody who was doxxed and outed and stuff in 2014 and tried to go back into hiding. Like he's a cyber forensics guru, so he'd be really good at deleting his identity. And then when it all the way leaked out, they're like, okay, prove it, bro. <laughs> he's like... <sighs> Well, I, I can I can tell you how much I know about Bitcoin as its creator, but all those files you're looking for, like those were in a fire nine months ago because I thought somebody was trying to kill me and I left the continent to save my family. And hmm. so it's like I, I there's a big part of me that's afraid we will never get a satisfying answer to this question. Hmm. And, <laughs> you know. It's like the cliffhanger. You watch a really good five part Netflix <laughs> documentary and it's right. like, I don't know, man, did she feed him to the tiger? Like, can we know? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. But what about the allusion to this process uh, called, I think it's called steganography. Correct me if I'm not saying that properly. Yeah, that's correct. About yeah. concealing some sort of signature within the text of a document. Is that what that is? He in, in the white space, actually. So Craig, Craig claimed and, and very, you know, he's sitting there in his three piece suit and whatever. And he's like, well, what you're they're telling him why his copy of the white paper that he submitted doesn't pass cyber forensic, whatever. And he's like, well, yeah, but your expert isn't actually a cryptography expert. If you could find an expert in steganography and I were to give them the cipher. Well, the message that's hidden in the white paper steganography hidden in the white space that would prove I'm Satoshi. And, and you know, and then everybody, everybody in the room's a little bit like, so are you going to do it? And he's just like, 
but but obviously so here's the problem right. it's in copa's incentive to no longer continue that train of questioning they right. don't want him to prove he's satoshi so so it was immediately a like turn around and look at his team and say okay moving on and just change the subject right yeah and you know and i'm i'm sitting here at you know, six o'clock in the morning watching uk court from the united states and going like oh like, so, like show us you know and yeah. But, so but is he no. gonna? <laughs> but that's yeah, that's another good incentive for him if he wants to prove it is to, that he can produce that, and that would be a that would be a crazy turn of events. So could you imagine the whole time there's a message <laughs> hidden in the white paper that only he has? On the other side of it, right. if you wanted to, if you wanted to create something after Hawk, that seems like something you might be able to do if you had the capability, like the if you were an expert do. in all yeah. the things, that right? He's right. An Just in. basically, you ever see those stenography? Right is. Could be wrong here, Kurt, but it's like you ever see those puzzles where it has like a, a the Bible and you put like a thing over it and it spells out words by blinking out the other things that are not there. Sure, sure. That's a yep. that that would be the idea. Yeah, yeah. Use a cipher like that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I mean, he's but you, have, but you have to have that. You have to have that thing. Yeah. Right. The, the overlay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Unless he went in and just at some point in like 2011 was like, wouldn't it be cool if I just did this and then decided to make <laughs> well, well, I am well, Craig Wright and, and, the, and this, in the Bitcoin white paper. This is the paper, problem you know? with any proof. <laughs> yeah. Right. The problem with any proof is the trillion dollars invested in him being a, a lying fraud. Sure. And so it's just the difficulty, especially the higher IQ individual it is, the harder it is going to be a pin anybody down regardless yeah. of his motivation. So, yeah. Why did Meta drop out of Copa at the last minute? Very good question. Uh, I they never made an announcement. There's been a lot of speculation. Um, it could be as simple as they just didn't want to renew their contract because they did drop out exactly two years after they joined. Mm -hmm. um, so it could have just been like, honestly, we don't feel like writing another million dollar check to keep our logo on the website. Right. Um, or it could be, you know, hey, we looked at the inherent risk in being part of this litigation and have decided to, <laughs> what if he's, do we want to be the company that tried to kill the inventor of Bitcoin, essentially? Like, the, you know, so it, 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 it could be anything in between those two things. Sure. But it came no, right no after he, no, we don't know. He, uh, so Craig Wright um, made a an offer to Copa to settle, right? And it, it, remember, I yeah. saw a, a post on X, it was published in a UK newspaper, mm -hmm. Uh, what was that settlement offer and and why do you think they declined it? <clears throat> so it was a very interesting chess move because Craig wrote it very strongly, um, like a, a still asserting his rights and basically saying, I'm going to, but, but he gave them so much that, that the offer was, what if I just decide to get, to quit all my litigation against everybody forever? Let's just compete in the open market and I'll continue to work on BSV at end chain and my patents and whatever, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to pursue my database rights. I'm not going to pursue my copyright stuff any further than it is like, so it was like a really, really, really juicy hook. Like any, anybody would want to bite it off and say, Hey, wouldn't it, can we just write off all the costs that, you know, and just be done. Um, now the reason they can't, um, is political. It's 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 kind of like Donald Trump offering something to, you know, CNN. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. hey, what yeah. if I what if I decide to go away? Like, I will admit that I'm a crook and that I lied about the election, but you got to make me the CEO. You know, it's like it's one of those <laughs> offers where it's like, oh, it'd be so great, and then the last bit is like, no, we can't do that, right? Yeah, yeah. But so, but it but it's interesting because. What it does is it, it makes it that no matter the outcome, like let's say Copa loses, he can just say like, man, I, tr I tried so hard to let you. So it's, it's kind of him. I think it's very Machiavellian in that it allows him to now go like, I'm going to burn everything. Like I'm going to burn your whole village and kill everyone in it. Yeah. Because look at what I offered you before you said I were still going to go to war with you, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the last peace offering before you go into battle. And now at the end of battle, we don't shake hands. Like, you're just all going to be killed now. Mm. <laughs> and so I, I kind of think that's what's going on in his head. But to his critics, they look at it and they're like, well, he knows he's going to lose. He's just trying to, he's trying to minimize the amount of damage that he takes in the loss is, is what the critics would say. 
Interesting. I'm so excited to see yeah. what side the judge <laughs> comes down on in this case. Um, Same. Well, Kurt, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, I want to let you get back to it, but I, I want to end on kind of maybe a high note. And I would like to understand more clearly, like what is the, what is the perfect world vision of what, what blockchain technology, what BSV, what, what any of this stuff can accomplish for the world? What is, what is Craig's vision or, or what is, you know, the, the big block vision for like what that utopia might look like? I think, you know, I don't want to speak for Craig, but I think he would largely agree with my assessment, which is why we've both ended up working on the same sorts of projects in BSV. It, it, it really is, you know, it's kind of a fix the money, fix the world, but how we fix the money is a very unique thing. Most of the problems of, of everything are about data integrity. It's, it's about not knowing what the truth is. And if, if we can, if we can eliminate all of the, he said, she said, and political or po politicization of data of truth of ownership, then all of a sudden we can, we can get past that and start to work on the next level of problems. I, I make the, I make the illustration about global warming before, before COVID-19 global warming was the biggest data integrity problem that we had, right? Like, is the planet warming? Yes or no. Mm -hmm. If it's warming, is it a natural occurrence and, or, or is it completely man? Is it capitalism's fault? Right. right. And then if it's capitalism's fault, what do we do about it? Like it's global communism, the solution, right? So it's, you have like three levels of, of questions that we basically can't answer because we cannot trust what the data is and then therefore what it means. Right. And so, but there's, global policy being made under the presumption that it is a man-made problem that, you know, that we need to curb capital. And so, so there's like these massive spillover effects of not having real understanding, like a true grasp of the data. Hmm. Now, what, what BSV allows us to do is maybe you put every bit of change of all the weather data in the whole world Every oracle on Earth, every time there's a precipitation change or a pressure change or a temperature change or whatever, that all goes on chain. And 100 years from now, we can make an objective assessment as to what is actually happening in the whole climate without having to trust, well, it's the UN's data model that we're going after, or it's some university that's been invested in by the Koch brothers data model or, or whatever. We can de depoliticize it and say, this is the data. And if we can say it's the data, now we can start to make objective decisions instead of completely subjective decisions that the other side, you know, the other 4 billion people on the planet won't respect because you're from the wrong political side. Um, so that's the kind of data integrity problem that, that BSV can solve. But then the money, the money issue, central banks are a massive problem with everything, the entire cause of freedom because a central bank can print money forever. And if you can create $10 trillion out of nowhere, then you can buy any person and anything and any government and any power that you want. Now we need to fix that problem. We need to have money that is issued in a way that is clearly understood and can't be violated. And it's, it is enforced by the absoluteness of the system that nobody can pull those levers. Now with that, we can also create, I'm, I'm on the fence about CBDCs, but if you if you want to use the asset at the low level as the the issuance asset and you have the CBDC on top, maybe it's a basket CBDC. Maybe it's the combined or balanced value of euro, yen, rubles and, and dollars. And we transact in that currency now globally to just simplify trade for everybody to depoliticize global trade while also having the issuance and control of Bitcoin is known and globally auditable and there can't be any more supply like the problem is inflation, right? So right. we'll know because it's on chain. Hey, did somebody just create another trillion dollars out of nowhere? Like I can check that very trivially from anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. That that changes everything. But it's so enticing because it reduces friction. So it actually brings central banks our direction and says, we're still going to issue the money. We're still going to make decisions about interest rates and some of these other things. But we're now accountable at least you know to the people who want to audit us we at least know how much fiat is in circulation at any given time and so it also makes them they have to be privy to this is the data about the money 
And so that, that's the dream. That's what BSV solves is you reduce friction from all these things where we can't know the truth about money and everything else. So that that's why I'm fighting for BSV. It's not about, I hope BSV goes to a thousand bucks a coin. Like that'd be great. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd go, uh, you know, I'd celebrate, but it's not, it's not the purpose. It's not the goal. The goal is, is give the world truth and let us compete in an economy where all truths can be known. And now it's fair. Now it's equitable. Now it's actually competitive. And <laughs> it's, it's where I want my kids to grow up. I, I, I would love for that to be in the history books that Kurt participated in some small way in ushering in this new epoch of freedom based on real data. I think that's a great place to end. It's great. Thank Kurt, you. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, man. Before we let you go. Thank you. Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, kind of everywhere. Uh, I have Kurt Wookert, jr.com. I'm Kurt Wookert Jr. But literally every social network, I am Kurt Wookert Jr. So Twitter, X, Instagram, Facebook, Telegram, WhatsApp, Kurt Wookert Jr. everywhere. Uh, don't DM me scams, but please do follow me <laughs> on social. And, and I do answer my DMs. They, they are bigger and bigger every day. So it might take me a little bit of time to follow up, but I do respond to all my DMs. And, uh, and I'm grateful for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We'll have to do it again sometime because I only had time to ask you like half the questions I had. So <laughs> if you'll come back, we'd love cool. to have you. Nice. All right. Thanks, thanks Kurt. Yep. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in to Human Reaction. Help us fight internet censorship by liking, commenting, subscribing, following, and sharing the show with your friends. To find us around the internet, visit linktree.com slash humanreactionpod. 